I'm here with Alex from Equivesto today, and I'm really excited because Alex is uh, uh, an expert in many things money, or maybe all things money. So Alex, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Will. Uh, it's it's great to be here, and it's great to chat with you about yeah. uh, money and finance and everything. Uh, I need it. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you're fine. Um, but yeah, I'm the I'm a managing director of Equivesto. Uh, Equivesto is an equity crowdfunding platform operating in Canada, and essentially we help individuals invest directly in businesses, both uh, small businesses and startups. So not public companies like you'd find on a stock market, but uh, new and innovative and exciting companies, uh, and people can invest with as little as a hundred dollars. Excuse me. Sorry, that's my phone going off there. Yes, uh, very important. And I'd love to talk to you about that. So before we get into the other stuff, what is equity crowdfunding, first of all? Um, and I'd say gear it more maybe towards entrepreneurs, if you can. If you're a, a founder of a company, what is the process of equity crowdfunding and what are the advantages over going to VCs and trying to fundraise kind of in the traditional way? Yeah. So equity crowdfunding is similar to going out and getting investment from other investors like you would typically from an angel investor or a venture capital firm. The difference with equity crowdfunding is you're now able to accept investment from the general public. So traditionally it wasn't possible to go out and get, you know, investment from everyone unless you went public and listed on a stock exchange. So with equity crowdfunding, it's now possible for you as a founder to get invested in by your followers, by your extended friends and family and your existing community. And these people can invest in much smaller amounts. So normally with angel investing, the minimum investment is like 25,000 or $50,000. But with equity crowdfunding, the minimum investment is as low as $100. And why, why was it like that? And why has it taken so long to change it to allow a normal person to invest a smaller sum of money into a private company? We'll probably get into the weeds of it a little bit uh, later on, but essentially um, the, the government and the, the regulators really want to make sure that uh, people are only getting access to investment opportunities that really fit their understanding and their risk profile. Mm. And so for a long time, the general consensus was these types of businesses are too risky for the general population to be able to understand and they wouldn't have right. um, enough knowledge to sort of get around the risks involved and make sure they make uh, the right decision. And I don't necessarily agree with that. So I'm glad that, right. you know, they, they changed the rules. Uh -huh. um, there's definitely still very high risk. And so it's important to go in sort of eyes wide open, but at least now it's not, oh, you don't have over a million dollars outside of your house, so you don't get to play at all. It doesn't matter what degrees you have or experience or anything. Um, now I think it's a little bit more uh, even and equitable. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point too that I want to touch on as well. And and uh, uh, let's we'll we'll get to that a little later. But I want to take a step back first and just figure out. How did you get into money? It's so far outside of my world. I don't have really any financiers or, or finance people in my family or even circle. So to me, I'm always interested in like, what drew you to finance uh, in the first place? And how did you, how did you become somebody no, so knowledgeable about something that I find so, uh, so complex? Oh, well, you know, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I'm hopefully after this conversation, it'll be a little bit less complex yeah, for you. That's what I'm um, hoping. But, but really, it's a situation of privilege. So I was lucky enough to be uh, born to parents who were definitely more money savvy. Mm. Uh, my dad specifically did a lot in business and worked in private equity and areas like that. So he had a lot of exposure to uh, investing, investing in companies, small businesses, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and then that sort of just translated to me. There's a book uh, called sort of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it just sort of yeah, emphasizes right. the impact of sort of the the upbringing you have and and the fact that a lot of the financial education isn't present well Ontario has just recently changed the curriculum for high school but up until recently um, financial education wasn't really present in our public education and so mm. you it created a sort of two-tier system right where you have individuals who grew up with parents really knowing a lot about money and investing and they were sort of set up for success and other individuals kind of had to go with their own if their parents didn't have that experience to, to pass on, right. which I don't think is really fair. 
Um, yeah. But now, at least in Ontario, they've changed the, the curriculum a little bit. So, you know, uh, financial literacy is included in the high school curriculum now, which is fantastic. That's great. Yeah. And I wish, uh, wish it had been when we were coming around. Although there's a lot of things that were included in the high school curriculum that I didn't master while I was there <laughs> anyway. So just because it's in the curriculum doesn't mean people will learn it uh, in any sort of applicable way. Uh, but it's True. great. That's a big step that they're actually putting in. And I didn't know that, which is really, really cool. Um, and that, I mean, I think that's like a lot of things, right? You know, m most knowledge uh, or skill sets uh, are very, uh, not hereditary, but but very much passed down through the knowledge of the family. Uh, right. So, for example, my father and mother were artists. So I grew up in a very creative household, a very uh, well read in terms of literature household. I was always sort of reading fiction and stuff, which a lot of people I know didn't kind of grow up with that emphasized. So I was really lucky on all those in all those areas, but not so much with an understanding of how finance worked. Uh, some other things like, you know, for example, I don't come from a family that has a, a building knowledge and knows how to build things or make things with their hands. So it's really interesting that, you know, you very much do get passed down what your parents know. Uh, and it can be really difficult to break out of that, even just from a sort of role model perspective. If you don't have anyone around you who who, who knows or values this knowledge base, it can be really right. hard for you to go find it on your own or to even know that it's even know where to look. So right. what what would you say were the main like resources or ideas or um, hmm. behaviors, let's say, that that you felt you grew up with that really helped you uh, uh, in this area? Yeah, so I think one of the most sort of fundamental that, you know, if people don't have a background or they grew up with sort of finance education in their life might not realize is when most people talk about saving money and their savings and money they're putting aside for uh, retirement or for a house or anything like that, they're not putting it in a savings account and leaving it there. They're actually right. investing it. And so that difference is quite large for, you know, if you hear the word saving, and if you're just going off what people are saying, you're saying, okay, they're putting it in a savings account. You know, I've made this money, I'm just going to store it and protect it here right. in a bank. And then, you know, it'll be there when I when I need it later. And what, you know, the majority of people are doing, they're actually taking that money and investing it in, you know, based on their own risk preferences in a variety of different potential investment opportunities to try to grow that money mm -hmm. as well as continuing to you know work for income and then moving some money from the income to that savings pile right so that's sort of one of the most core things i think um and sorry did you say the majority of people do do that or don't do that so the majority of people who are sort of finance savvy are uh, right. doing yeah. this. They're they're taking the money and moving it into what they call savings, but they're actually, actually an, investing. an investment. Right. And so do, would you say, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but would you say that the majority of people are financially savvy? Like let's use Canada as an example. Would you say the majority of Canadians are financially savvy or are not? Well, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. And actually back when I was founding Equivesta, we did a whole bunch of research on this right. and I have promptly forgotten it all as soon as <laughs> yeah. you asked me the question. But um, I think there was definitely uh, a, a large percentage that didn't consider themselves financially savvy. And it was interesting to see it sort of break down by age as well in the research. Mm. So as people got older, closer to retirement, they generally became more financially savvy, right. but yeah. younger individuals were less financially savvy. Um, yeah, there was definitely sort of a, a sort of reverse trend uh, in that in that data. Right. And in the sense that you got, and I don't know if you remember the numbers per se, but the sense that you have, would you say that uh, being financially savvy just in general is the is the norm or or not? Uh, so when I, you know, considering our our age group, so I would say like millennials and definitely sort of Gen Z, it mm -hmm. was um, probably 60 to 70 percent were not finance savvy. Right. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, you know, that's pretty that's actually a pretty shocking number, not not based on like what we know of reality, but just based on the fact that it, it runs pretty much everything we do. Right. Um, and, arguably more than than the political system. Right. Uh, if you think system. about right, all the choices that we're making and, and the implications of that in terms of, you know, young people entering the workforce or graduating from university needing to be able to make those right decisions for their future. Mm. If you start in the right way 
and you just sort of start small, it can have a much larger impact down the line with, with investing. One of the key things is having enough time. And right. so the fact that the young people who have the most time also don't have this knowledge, they're essentially losing out. Like if you don't learn the basics of investing and start putting money aside until you're like 30 or 35, you lost potentially 15 years right. of investing that you could have been doing. What um, do you think? So do you have a, do you have a handy like number uh, or mathematical example? Like, for example, if you invested, if you start investing when you're 20 versus 30, then by the time you retire, the difference is like X number hmm. or something. Do you have anything so like that? I, I, I don't have something off the top of my head, but I know that the average return of the entire U.S. stock market, the 500 largest companies in the U.S. stock market is usually between eight and 10% per year. If you look at every single year that it's been in existence. Right. And because of sort of compounding, it's, it's, it can really make a massive difference, uh, potentially even, you know, almost doubling the amount that you're putting aside. So if you think about starting to put aside a small amount, you know, every month or something into an investment portfolio when you're 20 and then retiring at 65 versus starting when you're 30 and um, at 65, it's not so much the the amount of money that you're putting away um, initially in between when you're 20 and 30. It's the impact of that money growing and then the interest and the return on that money still being invested for the further 20 years right. from 30 to uh, 50 or you know 30 years yeah, yeah. from 30 to 60. It's the right. impact there. So you'd say time is more important than dollar amount? If you are... Yeah, certainly when people are starting out, uh, if you look at the basis of our society, our capitalist society, one of the key beliefs is that time has a, a monetary value. Mm. Um, so not to sort of take you into my finance education, but I would uh, love to go into the like, let's go in there. Yeah, basically like a, a core belief that we have as a human society right now is that um Time is money. Time, yeah, exactly. And yeah. you can you can literally see that in terms of interest. If I give you $5 and you're going to give me that $5 back in a year, I'm going to request an increase on that $5. The $5 now is worth more than $5 a year from now. And, that, and built into that is the belief that you could take that $5 and do something with it to make money. Right. So that when it's time for me to get that back, because you've had it for that year, you've had an opportunity to create value with it that I have right. not. And yeah. so you're going to pay me for giving you that money for a year. Right. And so that's some and that's cultures. Where, sorry. Sorry. No, sorry. Just no to, please, please. Some, some cultures don't uh, are fundamentally against that, though. So different cultures basically say, no, we don't believe in the time value of money. You're not allowed to charge interest yeah, right. when lending money. Is that, um, so uh, what I know, I think of uh, uh, some Muslim cultures uh, that, that uh, usury is sort of kind of forbidden and therefore uh, this kind of interest is not, this game right. is not played. Well, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get old school with you. So um, you're an actor, yes. Merchant of Venice. Okay. By Shakespeare. Yes. You know the play. I so do. in the 1600s and the 1400s and that whole period, lending for in, with interest was also not allowed for Christians. It was totally right. against the Bible. Right. And everyone was like, no, you can't do this at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jewish people were allowed to do that. Yes. And so essentially Christians would go to Jewish people to borrow money. And that's right. sort of where this whole like conspiracy about Jewish people. Yeah, that's right. That, that garbage comes from. Yeah. Because we would go and then that's, they became the bankers. So if you yeah. think about the word bank, it actually comes from the word bench. Because right. Because you would go to the Jewish quarter and sit on a bench and, and negotiate to lend money. Right. Yes. <laughs> and uh, also, I mean, one important thing to add uh, as well, just to that conversation is that, uh, Jews were actually also prevented from doing a lot of trades that were seen as respectable Christian trades back totally, in the day. Totally. So there was a lot of kind of forcing uh, oh, yeah. uh, into that area. My well, family is Jewish yeah. though, and we know nothing about money now. So unfortunately I don't reap the benefits of, uh, of all that back then. But yeah, um, yeah and, and, but as you say, this is the basis of 
our system now uh, in, in North America, certainly, and, and, and much of the Western world, that the idea that money has va- money, yeah, being able to put money somewhere where you don't need it can collect interest that has value. Uh, right. And of course, that creates an incredibly unequal um, trajectory up the, 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 the social ladder, because right. If you start off with some, then it works for you and you can go up much faster. And if you start off with nothing, then you are, you cannot rise at the same level. So, you know, your company is called Equivesto. So obviously you're aiming to change this. Uh, I guess, first of all, why, how did you start to get uh, in your head that this was a problem you wanted to address? You're coming from kind of, I guess, an education of the system of the way right. that uh, that, you know, you could have easily just been like, well, this is how it works this is how we've always done it. Why was it important for you to kind of say, I want to change this and, and make it more fair? Yeah. So even, you know, even in my own privileged experience, when I wanted to go out and, and invest in, in different types of investments beyond just what was available in the stock market, I realized that even myself with all of that sort of privilege, I was not allowed to participate because I personally didn't have that level of wealth. At the same right. time, I could see based on that system, if you, if you look at it from the entrepreneur's perspective, essentially for your business, if you're doing an entrepreneurial startup, your business's success is directly tied to being able to get that initial capital, right. that seed round, that series A to boost you to the next level. And if we look at the, basically the situation in Canada and the United States before equity crowdfunding to go and get that capital, you essentially needed to go and get investment from angel investors and venture capitalists. Right. And they are the individuals with a lot of money. They invest in these type of businesses to, to make money themselves. Mm-hmm. And when making these sort of choices, especially with large amounts of money, even though there's a lot of logic, of course, and analysis that goes into it, part of it is also based on gut feeling. And built into that sometimes can be subconscious biases where you just have a bit more of a positive gut feeling about someone who looks like you, talks like right. you, yeah. dresses like you. Right. And so you end up seeing this sort of correlation between, you know, white guys in hoodies starting tech startups, getting millions of dollars right. and other people who don't fit that stereotype, not necessarily being able to get that important critical initial capital right. and if you expand that a little bit on a in a larger scale suddenly you realize holy moly the the potential and that the businesses that are being allowed to succeed the the new businesses are essentially businesses that are chosen by this sort of select few mm-hmm. right and there was no way for both on the investor side for other people to to participate and benefit from this creation of wealth Mm -hmm. other than these already wealthy individuals but also from the company side if you didn't fit this specific you know cutout you wouldn't be able to create and have your business really grow and succeed at the in the same way as some of these other individuals and then of course i guess that that would also have an effect on the communities that weren't getting funded as well so if you were from a community that didn't have as many people funded or small businesses funded and then again you didn't get funded those communities would of course stagnate themselves and then the rich communities where the people were coming from who had the connections and looked like the people they were asking for money from would flourish and then it's just a sort of virtuous cycle for one and a vicious cycle for the other right if you look at Silicon Valley and it's gone. If you think about what Silicon Valley was in like the 1970s or the 1960s, like it wasn't this big thing that everyone was talking about with filled with tons of wealth and all sorts of stuff. And that's all happened recently because individuals start a business, the business becomes successful because they get the support that they need. And then they are now wealthy. They've sold their business. Great. They're now wealthy they turn and fund more businesses. And so you just get more and more and more businesses in one location with a ton of wealth. You can just see how that wealth creation happened in, in the United States. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those pieces that, and again, this is my sort of reason that I say that I think economic um, systems have way more effect on our lives than political systems is that, you know, wealth and capital seem to be able to bypass a lot of red tape, let's say, right? Like if Mm -hmm. you have enough capital, you can kind of get anything done. And in general, to be empowered to affect change 
it's a lot quicker to be able to do that with your own money than to have to petition uh, the legislature or have to go to a local politician and say, please help us with this. If you can do it yourselves, and we're seeing that like a ton right now. I mean, individual uh, entrepreneurs and entertainers and athletes are donating to different funds uh, around you know, COVID or around like helping, you know, uh, remote workers or gig workers. We're seeing a lot of that. They don't need to go get a government grant to do that. They can just do it because of the capital they've been able to amass. Right. Um, and so I guess, like, how, how do you see the future with equity crowdfunding changing that? Like what, what is going to start to happen when people, when individuals can invest small sums of money and how can we as individuals and we as uh, business owners start to leverage this to create more, uh, more wealth generated outside of these traditional kind of communities that have held it? Yeah, well, it, it starts with, of course, the, the initial company that's raising the capital the first time. So instead of having to go and try to get investment from these external groups, now suddenly you can get the investment from your own community. So with even as little as $100, all these people can pool together and support your business. So your business that might not have had the capital to grow and prosper can now grow and prosper and sort of even you know the way we consider regular small businesses can grow and prosper and have a positive impact on their community. We always say that you know small business is the engine of the Canadian economy and, right. and all that sort of stuff. Well, it's something but like ninety percent of the jobs are created right by by entrep- by startups and small businesses. Right, something right. like that. Yeah, yeah, some something like that. But then with the difference here is now because that that investment came from the community the wealth that that business is creating is not passing to a small group of individuals who invested in it or just the founder of the business. It's also passing to the community members who invested in it. Right. And so it becomes a lot more circular in terms of creating the wealth. So right. you, for example, there's a new store uh, in your community and you go and shop at that store and you like it and you want to support that business. If you've also invested in it, your own money that you're spending to, to purchase this product and this service, a right. small piece of it is actually coming, coming back, back and creating you. your own, right. in, increasing your own wealth. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I can also see that uh, uh, being from a marketing and, and sort of attention economy perspective, I can see that being a huge draw. Like if we have, let's say a thousand people in a community who have all invested in a small business, those thousand people will have a huge incentive to go and tell all their friends about this business. Right. Uh, and the scale of that uh, could be, uh, you know, especially because word of mouth and, and referrals tend to be like one right. of the strongest engines of marketing. So the, the, the effect of that, you know, people with a stake in the company saying, you got to go here. I love this place and, or whatever it is uh, would be huge. And so, uh, you know, not just, uh, one investor paying some highfalutin media company to to do something. But, you know, that book, uh, A Thousand True Fans, you know about that mm, book? Yeah. Yeah. The idea that if you have a thousand people who are super into your company, then you can have a whole growth business just off those thousand people. And if those true fans also happen to be owners, then that's even, uh, that's even better. I, so it's almost like it takes a village to raise a startup kind of thing. Right. Well, it, and if you look at wealth creation and, you know, who the individuals who have become some of the wealthiest people in the world that we know of, it's always from their, their wealth usually stems from in sort of like 90% of the cases, they've created this business, or they've, they've helped grow a business from something much smaller. And because they've been an owner and a shareholder in that business, their wealth has been created because of that. And so so many people have further, you know, received wealth and had wealth created, because of that fact, if you look at the, you know, businesses entering the stock market and becoming some of the biggest companies in the world, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook, you know, all of those large companies, they didn't exist 50 years ago. And so all of that wealth has been created from essentially nothing from human ingenuity since, you know, 1970 or 1950. And a lot of that wealth has been created after they went public, but so much of it was created before they went public. You know, people always talk about, okay, imagine if I could have invested in Apple when it was first on the stock exchange, you know, in the 1980s and think about what it'd be worth now. But imagine if you had invested in Apple when it was worth nothing. Yeah. And it's it's so much more. Right, yeah. Um, 
And so that's Obviously. what you're you're giving people an opportunity to do is is get in like right on the ground floor with these uh, with these companies that have the potential for for insane growth. Right. Well, and so you know, I do want to hop in here and say you know they are much higher risk, and there is a reason why the government for so long tried to sort of keep this to people who they right. thought knew enough to participate and also had the wealth to be able to weather the loss of their money. Because many of these businesses don't end up being successful, you know, the vast majority of them. And so it's not, it's not that every single business is going to be the next Facebook, but it's that the idea is, is allowing people to participate in an amount that's small enough that even if a lot of them don't end up being successful, you still try to help that entrepreneur be successful. And for the ones that do end up being successful, then the benefit from that can sort of cover the the amount that you've lost in the other areas. Okay, this this brings me to a really uh, important question that I have, and I'm sure a lot of people do. If we're just getting into investing, because that's the position I'm in now. I, I haven't. Yeah. I mean, I've been investing since I was younger, but just on the uh, on the on the help of a really trustworthy accountant, who luckily, and this is a privilege of myself, is my parents knew this great accountant who's very trustworthy and very has made some you know good investments with some money that I was able to save up before for my acting career. So mm-hmm. I've been doing it with, but just not with much knowledge, and they've been very low risk things, right. uh, you know. But um, but now I'm getting into investing for myself and starting to take a more active role. So this idea that you say most of these are going to fail. So what is the strategy? I know people talk about, you know, diversify. And I think I know what that means, but I'd love to hear you explain that. Is it basically just like placing enough $2 bets on all the horses so that whichever horse wins, you're guaranteed to get something? Is that the idea or is it more complicated? That, that, no, that, that's essentially what it is. But before we even dive into sort of diversifying, I think the most important thing when people are considering getting into investing is... Um, trying to understand all the options that are out there for them from sort of the lowest risk to the highest risk. And then based on their own sort of gut feeling, once you have the knowledge of what the choices are, trying to feel for yourself, you know, where you might want to be putting what amounts of your money. Let's say you've got a thousand dollars and that's the amount of money that you're going to be investing. You want to see, okay, there's super low risk stuff where I'm putting it in a, what's called the GIC. And basically I'm just giving some of my money to the government and the government's promised me that they're going to pay me back that amount with a very small amount of interest every year. So that's basically almost as low risk as you can go all the way to the high risk stuff that I'm talking about investing in, you know, startups or, you know, investing in options and other derivative products on the stock market, which are rather complicated there's a whole range of things in between there right. that have different amounts of risk, but also different amounts of return. Uh, and so the the key thing, and we can talk about sort of why you might want to go for one or the other, depending on your life stage, but the key is to understand what some of those options are. Mm-hmm. And then based on how you are feeling internally with your money, you decide what percentage of your thousand dollars you want to put into each group. Right. Once you've sort of decided that, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, so you have, let's say you have a thousand dollars. Would, would you be, as you said, like, would you be, would you, would your, so your advice is not everyone should put, you know, uh, uh, 25% in the GIC, 25% in a low to medium risk, 25% in a medium to high and 25% in high risk. Your advice would be, you have to kind of understand yourself, what you are comfortable with. Uh, and, and I know that you've talked to me about, understanding your own risk profile, whether you're risk averse or risk, what's the other one? Um, if you, if you are pro risk, yeah. pro risk, right. Um, so how, how does one figure that out from their self, uh, uh, figure out for yourself? Like, you know, um, is it, as you said, is it just a gut feeling where you go, am I comfortable with putting a thousand dollars on something that I might lose it completely? Or am I not? Cause surely some people are just scared if they've never done it. So how do you know if you're just scared cause you're getting into it or how do you measure your own risk profile in a, in a, in a clear way? That's, that's a great question. Yeah. So it's, you can't just do a sort of cookie cutter scenario for everyone. Everyone's in a different kind of situation. And so it's important to actually take the time to understand each person's individual situation. And potentially you do want to get some, you know, financial advice from someone who's, who's licensed and would work with you. Um, who's a fiduciary. So mm-hmm. I don't know, I'll, I'll define that term yeah. a little bit. Yeah, please so, do. Um, 
essentially a fiduciary is someone who is legally bound to operate in your best interest. Right. And so you want to make sure you understand when you're getting financial advice from someone that you can understand whether they have a fiduciary responsibility to you or not. And the Uh, reason why I mention this is there's a lot of people with the title financial advisor, yeah, but that's a sales title. And so their job is selling mutual funds or other investment products. And so they will say to you, Hey, you know, I think this is a product that you should buy. You should buy this from me. So I make my commission. This is a good product for you. But you want to know if that person has a fiduciary responsibility to you, because if they don't, they could just be saying, you know, buy whatever I'm telling you to buy, buy this snake oil, buy whatever. Right. And is that because they're getting incentivized by the mutual fund itself saying we want to sell more? Uh... Yeah. So, yeah. so all, all, basically all financial advisors are incentivized by you investing through them and buying these products. They right. take a percentage of your money when you use them. That's how, but is there any, money. is there any extra incentive coming from the companies themselves, from the products, the companies that make the products themselves? Are yeah, they some saying of them you need that. to push this? On well, people? well, yeah, yes and no. So some products do that and some products don't, but also uh, some financial advisors will only offer the products of the company they work for. So if you are speaking to a, a, a financial advisor who works at one of the big five banks, for example, they might only be able to offer you mutual funds that are managed by a subsidiary of one of the big five banks. Right. I, yeah. that's, that's not necessarily for sure, but you want to ask these kind of questions uh, right. and you want to understand if they are a fiduciary and if they have a fiduciary responsibility to you or So not. can you just ask that question? So let's say you sit yep. down with a financial advisor. You just say, do you have a, are fidu- you, are you a fiduciary? Are you a fiduciary? And do if they say you no, have you a get fiduciary out of there? responsibility to me. You don't necessarily have to get out of there, but at least, you know, okay, this person is not legally bound to mm-hmm. operate in my best interests. Right. Doesn't sound great, but maybe maybe it could be okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, so as you... I said, I'm very new to this industry, so I don't uh, I don't know. My my instinct is uh, right. So okay, so back to the idea of figuring out your own risk profile. Right. right. If you have somebody who's a fiduciary, they can help you figure that out. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, but we can even go through right now, sort of the different kind of questions you might want to ask yourself when trying to determine your own risk profile. So let's assume that you've done a little bit of research and you've learned about you know, a whole bunch of different investment options. So you've got GICs, which is giving a little bit of money to the government. Low risk government. Yeah, right. Right. You've got uh, bonds. So giving money to a company and then my, and it's as a loan. And so the company is going to pay you back that loan plus interest. Okay. You've got mutual funds. So you're giving your money to someone. And sorry, are we moving up the risk ladder as we're going yeah, right now? Yeah, okay, we're slowly yeah. moving up the risk ladder. Okay. So now you've got mutual funds. So you're giving your money to someone who's pooling it with many other people's money to buy a whole bunch of different investment Mutually. products. It's a mutual fund. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I feel like I just clued into that term now, but <laughs> yeah. it's, um, you know, you say, there's a ter- oh, you say a word and it loses all meaning for you. And they're like, ah, because it's mutual. I see. Right. Yes. Um, and then there's, there's just directly investing in stocks yourself. And then you have investing directly in sort of, uh, startups or small businesses, right? That's sort of, we'll use that as the range. Okay. So, you know, that these products exist. Um, and also, you know, that every single choice, every investment product, everything in your life does carry some sort of risk. And so the key is not to say, necessarily, I only want to take this amount of risk, no matter what, the key is to say, I want to make sure that the amount of risk that I take is offset by the right amount of potential return. Yeah, right. Right. So if, you know, there's two choices of an activity that you can do, you can either go, you know, skydiving, or walking down the street. But in this imaginary world, the risk of you getting hurt is the same for each of those choices. So the thrill of skydiving or walking down the road, (laughs) you know, if, if there's like a 50% chance that you're going to die every time you walk down the road, you're like, this is stupid. I'm not going to walk down the road. (laughs) And so it's about making sure that you are able to understand 
the different risk of each and how that weighs against the potential benefits or rewards of that same activity. And then right. once you decide what that ratio is, that is your risk preference. A lot of people come in, sorry, I'll just finish sure, this sure, yeah, yeah. A lot of people come in and say, okay, I worked really hard for this money. You know, I want to make sure that nothing ever happens to it and it's going to be totally safe forever. Yeah. And you can do that. But that means that you're, you're not going to really invest your money anywhere where it's going to get return. And so that's like the people, GIC bond sort of right, options, right? right? Even, yeah. even in that scenario, technically, there is a tiny, tiny percent chance that Canada as a government could totally fail right. and yeah. collapse. <laughs> yeah. Canada doesn't exist anymore. And right. then they wouldn't pay you, you back. You get your money back. Yeah. Right. So, so you probably always... have bigger problems as a Canadian, I think, at that True. point. But yeah. True. But there's ev every choice you make, even if you put your money in your mattress, there's the risk that your house could burn down and all your money could be burned. Yeah. Or mattress. you get, you get robbed or yeah. Right. Right. So there's always, there's always a risk with, with any one of these things. Right. It's just about making sure you understand that, that balance between them. Now, do you need a good understanding of math and economic models to calculate that risk? Or is this, is, do, am I making it too complicated in my own head? Like um, how can so, I understand that? Yeah. Risk? So, so that's, that's, that's a great question. It really depends on the type of investment and the way that you want to be investing. And I'll, I'll explain. When judging investments, there's sort of two ways that you can judge them. One is a very technical um, analysis. So basically, you're going to say, okay, this stock on the stock market moved up and down this percent over the last five years. Right. And so based on these trends, I can calculate this is what it's going to do here. Mm -hmm. And all these sort of very complex calculations. Right. Um, or the other side is looking at more holistically, okay, what is the business trying to do? What are the things potentially standing in its way? How do I feel about these things? How do I feel about the economic situation as a whole and these other factors? Right. How do I feel about this whole thing? And how, you know, how do I think that that's going to translate to me? And as Sorry. a sort of yeah. tip, there are companies and people being paid millions of dollars in supercomputers doing option one. Yeah. So if you're trying to beat them, you better have a supercomputer too to be faster and quicker and sort of making those sort of timing decisions. Um, because there's always going to be someone who's literally put their office closer to the stock market. So the amount of cable that transmits the electronic signal to the trade terminal is shorter so they can beat you and wow. get even more profit from that kind of trade. So you want to be careful about kind of going down that route, unless you really have the technical skills to yeah. do that. Right. Also, that's assuming you have endless amounts of data about the investment you're considering. So that's a stock that's on the stock market and has lots of historical data of the price of the stock changing every day for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Some investments, you don't have that amount of historical data. Right, or especially almost, for startups and private companies, right? Right, right. Yeah. and so in that sort of scenario, you, don't, you have some data, so you want to look at that data. Of course, you don't want to ignore it, but it becomes a lot more, okay, how do I really feel about what they're trying to achieve and what the different risks are here and where, where do I want to come out and, and make my choice? And that basically demonstrates a difference between someone who's a very skilled investor and someone who's new to investing is the skilled investor has made a lot of really dumb choices already and they've learned from those dumb choices. And right. so they're trying to make fewer now. So, that, that segues really nicely into a question that I really wanted to ask you today as well, which is for an entrepreneur asking for funding, and this can be through equity crowdfunding, or it can be through the more traditional methods, but right. fundraising now, what are those decisions that most investors are basing uh, the risk assessment on? Mm. Uh, what do you think is more important? Is it their team that they have together? Is it the idea itself? Is it the product market fit? Is it the uh, trends of the industry, the trends of the economy? What are investors looking for most? I know my answers, but I'd love to love to hear yours. Yeah. And so, the, you know, that's a, again, another great, you've got a lot of really great questions today, Will. Um, but no, it's a, it's a great question. And I'll be honest, it is different for every investor. Right. And that's one thing with equity crowdfunding that's also different with angel investors, the majority of them, because they're investing in a similar way with a similar goal, will have a similar approach. 
right. and similar sort of metrics that they're looking at, even though there'll still be variability and difference between them. With uh, crowdfunding, because you can allow pretty much everyone to invest in your business, there's a much broader range. Some people are approaching it with those same metrics as um, an angel investor, but some people are approaching it as, oh, in this video, I like his socks, so I'm going to give him a hundred bucks. Or yeah. this company, their their idea is so cool, they're so passionate, I want to support that. There's right. such a range. Um, so for simplicity's sake, I'll focus on what you know someone who's really focused on investing from a return perspective yeah. might be looking at. Cool. And you hit on a lot of the really key ones. Uh, it's not just one idea or one factor that's going to sort of make or break it's how they all come together. Right. So if we start with, okay, the, the fundamentals, what does the business do and what does the market need right now? Right. And how is the business actually solving this? Do you think that what the business is doing is useful and needed? And do you think that the market is going to accept and like what the business is doing? Right. So you want to start there. You want to see, okay, let's say the business does do it well. What is the total possible size that the business could grow to? Or how could this market change in the future, right? right? Maybe if you're looking at some sort of newer technology product, the market isn't really big right now, but everyone's thinking the market's going to get big in the future. Why do they think it's going to get big? Do you think it'll get big? How is that going to work? And then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the company's idea is going to solve this problem, but are they actually approaching their customers and do they understand their customers well enough to yeah. provide that solution? That's a big one for, for me as well. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so once you've kind of got that and you've decided that the business sort of makes sense and that what they're trying to do makes sense, then you can say, okay, how are they actually going to make money doing this thing? Are they the going to be model? Right. Yeah. Are they going to be profitable making this? How will that work? What are their financial assumptions and what other assumptions are they making as they potentially grow or try to scale their business to make more money? Do I think that, you know, the guesses they're making make sense when they say, okay, right now we've got one customer and we can serve them by having me go to their house, give them the groceries. When we have 500 million customers, I'm still going to be the only person going and giving the groceries one at a time because if that's- it's, If it's Santa Claus, then you're fine. Exactly. But so other than you, that. Exactly. You want to make sure that they, they'll be able to scale properly and you understand the assumptions they're making right. when they do that. So that's when you really look at the financial projections and whether you think the assumptions they've made in the projections make sense. The financial right. projections are always made up. The numbers are yeah. sort of- they're, oh, we're going to be a trillion dollar company in 10 minutes. And, you know, they're yeah. always very uh, excited yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> and futuristic. And so, yes, you look at the projections and you want to see, okay, what in, in the perfect world, what do they imagine is possible? So you have an idea of like, wow, like they want to, they want to do this, but also yeah. you want to say, okay, don't really focus on these numbers because they're probably not going to happen. But what choices did they make when bringing this, Excel or projections document together? Have they said, okay, we're going to be able to have a billion sales in five minutes because then they don't understand marketing and customer acquisition. Yeah. Right. Or they've said, oh, our costs aren't going to go up, but we're going to have an extra 50,000 customers. Then they don't understand these other aspects. So you want yeah. to understand that whole approach. Right. So if you're just to, just to, to, to bring it back to the, to the founders who may be listening, right. um, if you're a founder, um, what pieces must you cover? Do you think for an investor pitch for them to feel comfortable with, with, uh, with, with your growth potential and the realistic nature of, of how you've kind of evaluated or, or projected your company? Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned, cause in a pitch, it's really about they're going to get into a lot of the due diligence later on. The right. pitch is much shorter. And so you don't necessarily want to try to cover every single aspect in your pitch. You might want to have slides in an appendices after right. your pitch. So when someone yeah. asks a question, you can be like, ha ha. Got those numbers right here. It's yeah. right here for you. But in your pitch, the short pitch itself, you really want to focus on a clear problem, how your solution is solving it and fixing right. that problem, yeah. why it's different. And the passion for your team, how it's going to create potential wealth, how you're going to be a good team to create this and make this successful, and then how you're going to translate that to returns for your investors. Right. 
Okay, fantastic. Unfortunately, we have to stop there for today. I'm going to get you back on as soon as I can, because I think we could just keep going and going for tons of these. Uh, but thanks so much for today, Alex. And yeah, there will definitely be a part two uh, as soon as possible. Uh, um, yeah, Alex, thank you so much for, for doing this today. It's been, it's been awesome. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, Will. Okay, take care. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Bye.